The year is 1990, and we are hot off the heels of a decade that saw the massive rise of Hollywood blockbusters, action movie stars, and major advancements in practical effects. Welcome to a year in film history, a new series where we're going to be going year by year to take a look at all of the interesting, controversial, and sometimes wacky things that happen in the film industry. And what better year to start off with than the year that ushered in the decade of neon clothing, grunge music, and CGI, 1990. A controversial Oscar winner, the birth of everyone's favorite movie database, and the introduction of what some consider to be the beginning of the second golden age of television are just some of the things we'll be going over. Let's start off with some numbers. In the year 1990, the average price of a movie ticket was $4.22, compared to 2021's $9.57. That's about a 127% increase in ticket prices in that 31-year period. During that same period, minimum wage only went up about 90%, from $3.80 to $7.25. I don't know what the crazier fact is, the growth in ticket prices or the fact that 1990 was 33 years ago. Today, companies can expect to pay between six to $7 million for a 30-second Super Bowl ad compared to only 700,000 in 1990. Talk about inflation, am I right? But enough depressing money news. Let's talk movies. Similar to most years, 1990 saw a huge number of great movies come out, so let's go over some of the particularly interesting ones. This was actually Kevin Costner's directorial debut and was the film adaptation of a novel by Michael Blake, which apparently no one wanted to publish. The film grossed a whopping $424.2 million worldwide at the box office, which resulted in upwards of $40 million in profit for Costner. Pretty good investment. This film went on to win the Oscars for Best Pick and Best Director. But it wasn't without controversy as the popular consensus was that a different film should have taken those little Golden Man trophies home. Goodfellas. I feel like this film needs no introduction, but for the one or two viewers that may not have seen it yet, Goodfellas is an American biographical crime film which was directed and co-written by Martin Scorsese along with Nicholas Pileggi. It's based on the real-life story and events of Henry Hill, who was an American mobster associated with the Lucchese crime family in New York. Although a classic, the film did poorly at the box office when compared to Dances with Wolves, earning only $47.1 million on a $25 million budget. Scorsese wanted to blur real life with the film and actually cast real-life mobsters as extras, many of which knew Henry Hill personally. Fun fact, Scorsese actually gave roles to his parents in the film. His mother played Tommy's mother during the dinner scene where Joe Pesci takes the big knife, and his father played Charles, the prisoner who makes the mistake of putting too many onions in the tomato sauce. But they weren't just there to be in the film, they actually helped out during production, especially his mother, who pressed all the gangsters' shirt collars since Scorsese didn't trust anyone else to do a proper job. Scorsese is definitely a stickler when it comes to the details. He even had the iconic soundtrack for the film planned out three years before the production began. At the time, it was one of the most expensive soundtracks ever made because of all of the licensing fees. But if this film is such a classic and so iconic, why didn't it win the Oscar for Best Picture and Best Director? Even though Goodfellas had more critical acclaim that year, the main reason most seemed to think it lost was because it didn't push any barriers. It was an amazing, even flawless movie, but it was another crime film which we've seen the likes of multiple times before. Dances with Wolves pushed barriers in terms of its pacing and overall length. It was a great film that was almost four hours long and critics really enjoyed this. Movies at the time were getting shorter and shorter because of their blockbuster, high-budget nature, but Dances with Wolves pushed the envelope and critics wanted more of this. It was also a film that made the general audience see Native Americans as real people, unlike the westerns of the past. But we want to hear what you think. Was Goodfellas snubbed of an Oscar? Are the reasons I mentioned above valid? Okay, let's move on to another movie. There was a movie that came out this year that had a huge impact on the independent film landscape and influenced what it is today. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I know, it sounds like a joke, but it's not. TMNT was a film based on the popular comics and later cartoons of the same name. During the 80s, the Turtles were a pop culture phenomenon, and this live action adaptation ushered in the decade where their franchise would hit a commercial peak. The movie grossed an extraordinary $202 million at the box office worldwide. It was a hit and became the highest grossing indie film of all time, and still sits at number 20 today. It showed Hollywood that there is a lot of money to be made with independent films. This film's success is one of the contributing factors for the creation of some of the indie film studios that started popping up in the 90s. Up until then, the two major independent film studios were Miramax and New Line Cinema, which was responsible for this film. After that, we saw many major studios creating spin-off indie studios such as Sony Pictures Classics. 
Searchlight Pictures, and Paramount Vantage. We've talked a lot about money and box office performances, but we haven't mentioned the highest grossing film of the year yet. It was the film that will forever be referenced or parodied whenever pottery is mentioned, Ghost. Starring Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore, and Whoopi Goldberg, Ghost was a film created on a budget of $22 million, but went on to gross a mind-boggling $505.7 million at the box office. Having outperformed Ghostbusters and Tim Burton's Batman, which were released in the previous decade, Ghost is sometimes referred to as Hollywood's forgotten blockbuster. But why did it do so well at the box office? Well, the general consensus was the romance, the pottery scene, and most importantly, star power. Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore, and Whoopi Goldberg were some of the biggest stars at the time, and this was still at a time where star power meant the world when it came to drawing in audiences, unlike in today's IP-driven culture. The movie was also pretty good, going on to get Oscar nominations for Best Picture, Best Film Editing, Best Music, Original Score, and even won Best Screenplay and Best Actress in a Supporting Role for Whoopi Goldberg's performance. If this movie came out today, I don't think it would do as well as it did, independent of who was in it. But at the time of its release, the film industry was different. Movies didn't get at-home releases until eight or nine months until after they came out in theaters, so people were more enticed to see them in theaters instead of just waiting a few weeks or a couple of months to watch them at home. In 1990, we also saw the release of a fan favorite Tim Burton film. Edward Scissorhands, a fantasy romance with a very odd vibe that starred Johnny Depp and Winona Ryder. It is often considered to be Johnny Depp's breakout role. Depp was already being labeled as a teen heartthrob after starring in 21 Jump Street. No, not the movie with Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill, but the 1987 TV show with the same premise. He resented this heartthrob label and left the series in 1990 to appear in Crybaby, which was still well in the heartthrob territory, and Edward Scissorhands. Unfortunately for Depp, he was never able to escape his heartthrob image. This was the first of many films that Johnny Johnny Depp and Tim Burton would work on together. Pretty Woman also came out this year, starring Julia Roberts and Richard Gere. The film was a massive success and pushed Julia Roberts into superstardom. It raked in $463.4 million on a budget of only $14 million. Today, Box Office Mojo listed as the number one romantic comedy ever based on number of domestic tickets sold, and the number four rom-com based on box office. But it might have been even higher if it wasn't for the cheaper price of movie tickets back then. This year, we also saw the release of the massively successful Home Alone, which brought in $400 176.7 at the box office on a budget of 18 million. The movie did all right with the critics, but that doesn't really matter considering its success and the fact that it became a pop culture phenomenon around the world. To this day, I know people in both Canada and Poland that watch this movie yearly during the Christmas season. It's so popular in Poland that in 2010, the Polish TV channel Polsat didn't play it over the holidays, which caused over 90,000 people to protest on Facebook. 1990 also saw the release of a few third entries to major film franchises. Back to the Future Part 3, Godfather Part 3, and Exorcist 3. Of these, Godfather Part 3 is the most controversial entry. Today, it's considered to be the worst in the trilogy and people make fun of it, mostly because of the terrible performance by Francis Ford Coppola's own daughter, Sofia Coppola, who played Mary Corleone in the film. The general consensus is that the only reason she was in the film was nepotism, and without her, the film would have been much better. Back in 1990, the film was still considered to be good and even got seven Oscar nominations, including Best Picture. But one opinion was the same in 1990, as it is today, that Sofia Coppola sucked. She got nominated for the Worst Supporting Actress and Worst New Star at the Golden Raspberry Awards, otherwise known as the Razzies, and took home both trophies. To finish off the film section, let's list a few films we saw come out this year by some notable directors. We have Misery by Rob Reiner, Wild at Heart by David Lynch, Mo Better Blues from Spike Lee, and Miller's Crossing by Joe Cohen, among many more. In this section, we'll go over the 1991 Oscars that were for movies released in 1990. A total of 76 million people tuned in to the 63rd Academy Awards at some point to watch Billy Crystal host that year's ceremony. Dances with Wolves had the most nominations with a total of 12, going on to win seven of them, which you can see here. Dick Tracy, The Godfather Part 3, and Goodfellas were three other films that received multiple nominations, with seven, seven, and six respectively, with Dick Tracy pulling three wins and Goodfellas just one. One thing to keep in mind when looking at these awards is that these were the last Oscars where there were no official nominees for Best Visual Effects. 
Total Recall was given a special achievement award under that category though. That year's Oscars saw viewership increase 6% from the previous year's ceremony, but the reviews were mixed. There were many criticizing the ceremony as being fairly boring and missing the mark for the general audience. Billy Crystal was criticized for using an abundance of inside showbiz jokes that didn't resonate well with people at home. That being said, in 1991, the ceremony was nominated for nine primetime Emmys going on to win three of them. I'll be totally honest with you. I didn't know the Oscars could win Emmys. An award show winning awards is news to me. Billy Crystal won an Emmy for outstanding individual performance in a variety or music program that year. It might've been something to do with the fact that he exited the ceremony on a horse. Pretty badass. Unlike some of the later years from this decade, 1990 didn't push the envelope of filmmaking as much as years to come, but it still gave us some pretty interesting things that are worth talking about. Everyone's favorite movie database launched this year, IMDB, but it wasn't what you might think. It was started by Cole Needham as a list of actresses with beautiful eyes. There were other lists out there related to the film industry created by other people, and on October 17th, 1990, Needham developed and posted a script that could be used to search across the other lists. This was the birth of the database that would become IMDB. At that time, it was known as the rec.arts.movies movie database. Not very catchy. Today, IMDB is owned by Amazon and is continuously growing and expanding its feature set. In 1990, we also saw some advancements for how computers could be used to help make films. The two biggest advancements came from The Rescuers Down Under and Die Hard 2's production. The Rescuers Down Under was the first traditionally animated film to be made with a fully digital process. This means that instead of using actual ink and paint, this movie used computers with what is known as a computer animation production system, or CAPS for short. This allowed artists to use digital ink, paint, and compositing. It allowed post-production to be more efficient and sophisticated. It worked so well that it ushered in a new era of traditional animation. And Die Hard 2 was the first film to use digitally composited live action footage with a traditional matte painting, or in short, the first digitally manipulated matte painting. But what is a matte painting, you may ask? A matte painting is an image, traditionally an actual painting of an environment or place that we normally wouldn't have access to, that when combined with film, would give the illusion that the characters are in that place. They're basically a fancy word for background images that make it look like someone is in a different location. For this film, they still used the traditional painting, but photographed it and scanned it into a computer to composite it with the live action footage. Today, almost all matte paintings are done digitally. When Photoshop came out, it changed the game because it allowed artists to speed up the creation and manipulation of them. And the last bit of tech we wanted to talk about for this section is related to the 1990 FIFA World Cup. On June 8th, 1990, the World Cup began in Italy, which was broadcasted in HD. This was the first broadcast of digital HD TV in history. I wonder if the hand of God had anything to do with this. 1990 didn't have many super interesting pop culture events, but let's quickly go over the few that we found. This year, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman got married, but their marriage ended in a bitter divorce after 11 years in 2001. We're still unsure what the main reason for divorce was, but most point to the fact that Kidman refused to become a devoted member of the Church of Scientology. Chuck Norris became the first Westerner in documented Taekwondo history to be awarded the rank of eighth degree black belt grand master. I guess those roundhouse kicks to the face aren't just for show, they can do some real damage. And finally, Nickelodeon Studios and Universal Studios Orlando opened in Florida this year. Also in this section, we wanted to go over the class of 1990 and the deaths of 1990. The class of 1990 are some notable people in the film and television industry that were born in 1990. We have a few pretty big names that are on this list, one of which we have an entire video about already. Margot Robbie. We also see names like Jennifer Lawrence, Emma Watson, Kristen Stewart, and Aaron Taylor Johnson, among many more. We won't go over all of the deaths that happened this year, but we wanted to pay respect to a few, which you can see on screen now. We'll include a link to a longer list in the description. 1990 wasn't only significant because of the film industry though, it was also a big year for television. We already mentioned how this year's World Cup was the first broadcast of digital HDTV in history, but there were many more interesting things that happened on the little screen in your living room. On April 8th, 1990, the pilot episode for the very successful show Twin Peaks aired for the first time. It was basically a movie with its one hour and 34 minute runtime and was directed by our boy, David Lynch, who also released Wild at Heart that same year. The show went on to amass a huge following and garner praise from critics and audiences alike. Some claim that it was this show that kickstarted the second golden age of TV because it resulted in TV shows being taken more seriously. 
But others claim the second golden age was actually kickstarted by HBO's The Sopranos. What do you think? Comment down below. Twin Peaks went on for two seasons before concluding in 1991 and having a movie tie-in release in 1992. The show continued in 2017 with their third season, Twin Peaks The Return, which saw many of the same characters reprise their roles. To this day, I know people who can recognize the intro theme by just hearing that first guitar note. Absolutely iconic. The most popular show in 1990 was NBC's Cheers, which was a comedy drama that ended its eighth season and started its ninth during this year. The show ended in 1993 after a total of 11 seasons and 275 episodes. Okay, let's move on. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. Okay, enough of that. We talked about 1990 without mentioning one of the most influential and remembered 90s shows out there, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. The show isn't only known for its catchy theme song, but also for how it successfully tackled some very important social issues, such as drug abuse and racial identity, while still remaining entertaining. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is one of the most 90s feeling shows out there, especially with its fashion. It's also been described as an encapsulation of what it felt like to be a youth during that time. Fresh Prince also catapulted Will Smith into the mainstream. He went on to have a very successful career and hasn't been part of any controversial events whatsoever. All jokes aside, he did have an amazing career and give us some truly memorable films. There is a show that released in 1990 that is still airing today and has broken records for being the longest running American sitcom, The Simpsons. It first aired on Fox in May of 1990, even though it was originally started in December of 1989. It was Fox's first series to land in the top 30 ratings in a season. The show still airs new episodes to this date and is currently on its 34th season with 740 episodes released as of writing this video. The Simpsons are one of the most iconic and recognizable American families and have had many spin-offs including movies, games, and more. Unfortunately, it seems that season after season, the number of viewers that continues to watch has been on the decline, with an average of 2.25 million viewers tuning in per episode for season 33, a long way off from its season one high of 27.8 million average viewers. But let's move on. On January 1st, 1990, we were also introduced to everyone's favorite lovable goof. Mr. Bean. Based on a character developed by Rowan Atkinson during his time studying for a master's degree in electrical engineering at the Queen's College, Oxford, it was yet another pop culture phenomenon that although originally broadcast in the UK, went on to be popular worldwide. The show was so popular that we saw two films, an animated series, and books spun off about him. Rowan Atkinson even reprised his role as Mr. Bean for a live performance as part of the 2012 London Summer Olympics opening ceremony. With how popular Mr. Bean was, I was surprised to learn that the actor the actual show that started all of this consisted of only 15 episodes that were 24 to 26 minutes long each. It took only 15 episodes to cement Mr. Bean, Teddy, and a citron green mini into the pop culture history books. And finally, on the topic of British TV, the British sitcom called Heil Honey I'm Home aired in 1990. It was about Hitler and Eva who lived next to a Jewish couple. Unsurprisingly, it was cancelled after only one season, leaving seven episodes unaired. Thanks for watching. As you can see, there was a ton to talk about from only the year 1990, and we're just getting started with this series. Let us know if there were any interesting things we missed in the comments. If you like these kinds of videos, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, have a good one.